，观自在菩萨行深般若波罗蜜多时，照见五蕴皆空，度一切苦厄，设粒子，色不异空，空不异色，色即是空，空即是色，受想行识亦复如是。Texting. Texting. 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 Um. Mark will. Tomek present texting. Join us, be us, whatever we are, whatever you think we are, or don't. For who is to say we even exist? None of us knows what we are doing, nor where we are going, and none of us cares, nor should we. We are artists and drunks, instigators and punks, deadbeats and musicians, buskers and magicians, lovers and haters, a gang of anarchists and bodhisattvas. Not one of us foresees the ultimate significance of our deeds. Not one of us can fathom the end result of our disruptions. We are a wrecking crew, a band of secular monks. I'm gonna stop us there, Mark. That sounds familiar. It may do. It may do. Yeah, I should credit you as the,、uh, or your acronym of Maku as the author of that piece. But should we kickstart the show? Let's do it. All right. Hello, all you textual deviants, and welcome to another episode of Texting. I'm Mark Will in Taipei, and I'm Tomek in Saint Petersburg. It's interesting you start with that. Before we went live, you were telling me that we've been knowing each other for fifteen years. Yeah, I was kind of surprised. Like, yeah, I mean,、Why? I knew Korea was back、Seems、in the day,、longer. but fifteen years is a long time. I don't know. Seems、uh, like you know thirty. For, for for me, like just anything that's like a fifteen year period, I think it's because I move so much, and、uh, because a lot of my friendships now seem to take place like in in sections and then kind of drift away. So to have anything stay for fifteen years is pretty remarkable. But anyway, let's、uh, let's get the attention off of us and. And onto the listener, and what the listener is going to well, expect. Well, but do you want to tell people what that was you were reading? Absolutely, yeah. So that was an excerpt from Korealist advertisement、um, from our joint magazine venture, our pamphlet, as Ken would say, Koreality、uh, <laughs> uh, and、uh, comic book. <laughs> and I thought that this particular excerpt really captured. Some of the tone of the text that we're going to be discussing today. Well, there are some key words in that, right? I heard bodhisattvas.、Mm-hmm. Uh, what else? Secular monks. But even in the first part, whatever you think we are or don't, for who is to say we even exist? Ah,、uh, yes. Right. Well, then uh, let's uh, use that as a segue into. Today's text, which is the Heart Sutra, and the Heart Sutra is a key text of Mahayana Buddhism, which is the form of Buddhism most popular in East Asia. I guess、uh, certainly it is、uh, very popular here in Taiwan, where where I live. And in fact, I didn't realize this when I chose the the text, the Heart Sutra. I I just recently came to read it carefully, and you know, was fascinated by it. But、uh, I've actually been exposed to this for a very long time, like as long as I've been here. Probably I heard some version of it in Korea as well, or when I visited Japan. Or China or whatever, but、uh, it's it's very popular here because at temples you can receive this little gold、uh, laminated card. On one side is a picture of the goddess 
of mercy, Guan Yin, and then on the back, surrounded by a border of swastikas, not the Nazi kind, don't cancel us, <laughs> but the Buddhist swastikas around that border is the actual text of the Heart Sutra called in Chinese Xinjing. That's the Heart Sutra. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the Chinese version of this text. So Great. before we get into it, I want to read the translation that I cobbled together. I myself cobbled together from uh, translations I found online. And there are two in particular. One is from a word-by-word -word or character-by-character -character Chinese to English translation. That's the one I looked at most closely because, you know, it's interesting for me to look at the Chinese characters and try to understand it. I mean, my Chinese is not good. But I can understand. I have, you know, a basic comprehension of grammar and uh, I recognize a lot of these characters and there's some that I want to talk about because they're very interesting. And then I also looked at a translation from the original Sanskrit uh, to English. And that, uh, the Chinese one you can find on medium.com. It's by uh, Mr. John Shabo, S-Z-A-B-O. His, his post on this is excellent. It's just called the Heart Sutra can find it at medium.com i like his whole post uh very easy to follow interlinear translation uh, and then the sanskrit to english version is by the tree ratna buddhist community so i i cobbled it together my translation from these two i you know looked at both of those made can i add one little choices. side note yes i don't know how vital it is but it does seem like the critical consensus now is that the original was in Chinese. The Sanskrit then kind of posited to be the original to kind of give it more credibility, but most scholars now see it as coming from Chinese and then to Sanskrit. Just I saw that. I saw that. Uh, that's hard for me to believe. I mean... I, I guess it's not impossible, but the Chinese version has a lot of words that are clearly translations of these, you know, Hindu Buddhist or Buddhist, uh, you know, Sanskrit religious terms, you know, and names too. So I don't know. I mean, there must be some reason why they are pretty confident about this, though. Well, maybe maybe there is a consensus. I mean. Even if that's true, like they like the Chinese text was written first, it's still based on, you know, Sanskrit or Indian, Hindu, Buddhist sure, sure. religious concepts, right? As we'll sure. see. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, for example, like when my wife reads this, uh, when she reads it, there are many words she doesn't understand because they're clearly just... Chinese translations of Hindu okay, names okay. or concepts. Mm -hmm. So even if the Chinese text came first, um, you know, it's based on these Hindu or Indian Buddhist concepts. And they're, you know, just incorporating those terms and names into the Chinese text. Okay. But uh, regardless, sure. uh, let me read... The translation that I uh, more or less finalized this afternoon, I, I would still like to edit certain things, but I think it'll give you and listeners a good idea of uh, what the text uh, should sound like in English, and then we will go section by section and break it down. How about Great. that? Sounds good, man. All right, here we go. Prajna Paramita Heart Sutra. Guan Zizai Bodhisattva, while meditating deeply on Prajna Paramita, saw the emptiness of all five skandhas and left all suffering behind. Sariputra, form is nothing other than emptiness. 
Emptiness is nothing other than form. Form itself is emptiness. Emptiness itself is form. Feeling, thought, action, awareness are also like this. Sariputra. Truly, all things are characterized by emptiness. Not arising, not ceasing. Not impure, not pure. Not growing, not withering. So in emptiness there is no form. No feeling, thought, action, awareness. No eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. No color, sound, smell, taste, touch, cognition. Not even the act of sensing. There is no ignorance and no end of ignorance. No old age or death. No end of old age or death. No suffering, no cause, no end, no path. No wisdom and no attainment. Because nothing can be attained. So bodhisattvas rely on prajnaparamita in order that their hearts might have no mental blockage. No mental blockage means having no fear. Leaving behind all confused dreamlike illusions, they finally reach nirvana. Throughout the three ages, all the Buddhas have relied on prajnaparamita to reach anuttara samyak sambodhi. Know then that Prajnaparamita is a great magic mantra, a great wisdom mantra, a peerless supreme mantra, an extraordinary uncommon mantra. It can eliminate all suffering in truth without falsehood. So chant the Prajnaparamita mantra. Chant these mantra words. Gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate. Bodhiswaha. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Have we decided to opt for a moment of silence? <laughs> I don't know. I was leaving that up to you. Okay. All right. Prajnaparamita Heart Sutra. So, of course, the first, this is the title, right? That's the name of this text. So Prajnaparamita, uh, what does that mean? Well, again, this is a Hindu term. So from the Sanskrit, Prajna is wisdom, Paramita is transcendence or perfection. So transcendental wisdom, perfect wisdom, Heart Sutra. That's the title of this text. Now, as I said in Chinese, it's usually called the Xinjing, the Heart Sutra. But this word, Jing in Chinese, is very interesting. You may recognize it because you've heard of Yi Jing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Book of Changes. You've mm -hmm. heard of Tao De Jing, right? Mm -hmm. The Tao Virtue Book. So this Jing means book or classic or more literally text whoa, 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 whoa. yeah so the word jing in chinese is equivalent to the english word warp so you know when you're making a textile you're sewing something right you've got two uh you've got threads going two different ways right the warp is going usually vertically right you've got strings going up and down and then the weft or woof is the thread that the cross thread right that goes through it and holds the thing together okay you understand i think i follow yeah so that's interesting jing actually means you could say a, a synonym would be text in both both cases actually in the case of sutra too which we'll look at i mean we're talking the 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 metaphor is from sewing or textiles right a text we know that our word text from the latin is uh, related to textile so it has to do with like sewing something together a text is something that's sewn together mm -hmm. just as i sewed this translation together right mm -hmm. uh from various bits uh and then the chinese jing that's talking about uh 
one uh, part of a textile too. And the reason is because the earliest Chinese books were like strips of bamboo, like vertical strips of bamboo. And then they were, we think they were tied together with string. So those were the first books. So, you know, when we talk about book of changes, it's, a, it's probably like text of changes. It, it may have originally been written on bamboo strips. That's the warp of the textile. You see? I think so. So Heart Sutra is what in Chinese? Xin Jing. Xin is okay. heart and Jing is like in Tao Te Jing and I okay, Jing. Okay, so Xin you know? is heart. Yeah. Okay. But Jing is the, this is the part that means book. It's translated here, Sutra. Right. But really it's basically text, you know. And again, nice. it's it's take the original word comes from uh, this uh, concept of sewing, right? Or or as I say, the English equivalent is the warp of the warp and weft or woof. You know, you need both to to make. I don't really understand that those like sticks together. To what? I don't understand like the what's the word? The other W words after warp. Warp. Is the, you know, we're imagining the warp as the part that goes up and down, vertical, uh, vertical, yes. And then the weft or woof is the part, it's the cross thread. It goes the other way. It threads through those other threads to hold everything together. Oh, okay. Got you. Yeah. Now, so we talked about, we talked about text. We talked about Jing. Now, sutra, where does that come from? You know it's related to suture, right? Okay. Like like stitches. Right. So that too is is taking I mean the the word is also, you know, related to this idea of sewing. Right. So all of these words basically mean text in the sense of textile, something that's sewn together. I think that's fascinating. Yeah, I think there's a nice like intimacy to well, if we if we talk about you said what did you call it suits? I know this word. Suture. Yeah, suture. Well, I mean, S- suture S U T S U T U R E, suture. Right. You know? So, because you, suture uh, is it's something like, a doctor does when he sews you up or she sews right, you up. Right, right, sure, sure. I had them near my testicles once. Nice. Yeah. So, a testicular suture. <laughs> That's always fun. Well, I, I was just imagine. thinking, like, uh, well, it just, it just gives it quite a nice intimacy of then if we're talking about, like, heart sutures, right? Something that you would, like, stitch close to your heart in a way. I mean, I know that's not necessarily the the explicit translation, but it's a nice image. Hmm. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think all of those associations are valid to make but uh you know this is the essential sutra about prajna paramita you know wisdom uh transcendental wisdom perfect wisdom Mm -hmm. okay so that explains the title now we've got this character guan satsai bodhisattva uh this is the Chinese version of the, you know, Buddhist uh, Bodhisattva Avalokitesvara. In Chinese, he is called Guansatsai Bodhisattva. Okay. But that is a masculine character. And now when this is read, you know, in Chinese speaking areas it's understood that this is actually guanyin the goddess of mercy so that there's been like a gender switch it's not it's not that masculine character it's rather guanyin the goddess of mercy and she's one of the most popular deities in chinese speaking parts of the world what do you mean so they're just changing the personage of the of this buddhist bodhisattva 
Well, I guess the you know, it's understood that this Bodhisattva had many emanations or forms, some of which were masculine, some of which were feminine, and the most popular is uh, Guan Yin, the goddess. I mean, you know, okay. it's like it's like uh, Krishna is an uh, avatar of of who Vishnu. I just didn't realize that, like, even the idea of like God and goddess, I don't. That seems a bit foreign to me from Buddhism, to some extent, right? Well, kind of I mean, like... you know, it, maybe, maybe uh, it would be more accurate to say female bodhisattva, but she, Guan Yin is definitely worshipped as a goddess, you know. Okay. So uh, let's just think of her as goddess of mercy. So this Guan Tsai Bodhisattva in in the text is generally understood to be Guan Yin, goddess of mercy or Bodhisattva of mercy. So while meditating deeply on transcendental wisdom, she saw the emptiness of all five skandhas. Now these this again this is a concept from. Uh, you know, Indian tradition. So a skandha is one of the five elements or aggregates of clinging, which I've translated form, feeling, thought, action, awareness. So mm -hmm. all the things that cause us to cling. Right. So she saw the emptiness of those and left all suffering behind. Anything you want to say about that? Um... No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you could ask me a question, I guess, but uh, so far it's fairly straightforward. Okay. I mean, unless I could, like, clarify something for the audience. I mean, just to simplify for some people, maybe when you said clinging, that could also mean craving or just any sense of attachment. So that might just mm -hmm. simplify that particular word a little bit. Um and uh yeah originally i thought maybe like the skandhas were the senses but obviously they're not but because they but the senses are just one of kind of these different ways that we cling right but yeah feelings form thought as you said and then awareness could also just be like consciousness so just any kind of yeah i guess that's all fairly straightforward so i think you can go on I wonder to what degree those five skandhas are arbitrary. I mean, why five? Only five? Uh, or not fewer than five? Why five? Yeah, I don't know how... I mean, unless you're looking at it from... Unless you're really big on, like, the kind of sacred or, you know godlike symbolism of numbers i i think it's more interesting just as a to understand the basic philosophical concept which is the things that we cling to in the material world sure sure but i mean someone had to decide okay there're 5 not 4 not 6 not 10,000 not 2 they're 5 well, you know they seem I mean? pretty comprehensive, like in, right? You got the emotions, you've got the brain activity, you've got everything we do, you've got everything we see in the form, and and then you could say like awareness could even be like an umbrella of all of those in some way. Yeah, this is kind of yeah. Like everything we're perceiving. So, so it so it it could be considered redundant in a way. I mean, it's to me, it's like you know the elements. Right, mm -hmm. like the the Chinese recognize five elements, whereas the Greeks recognize four. You know, the ancient Greeks. Right. So it's just like it's you just have to accept a certain arbitrariness of every system. Right. All right, then we have this interesting word Sariputra, which is. Uh, 
Well, it's that's the name. Guan Zizai's homie, isn't it? Yes, it's it's one of Buddha's chief disciples, and I guess he was hanging out with, <laughs> you know, the Bodhisattva at this time. And they were at a mountain. I can't remember what the name of the mountain was, but it's a it's a mountain where apparently many of these revelations or or sutras were dictated. So. Maybe like the Buddhist okay. Mount, Mount Sinai or something. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, so I guess everything from here on out should be in quotation marks because this is like what... This is like a monologue or a Right, kind this is of, where the lecture starts. Yeah, it's a lecture or, or sermon that, you know, right. Guan Tzai is giving to Sariputra. Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, yeah, there you just go. Just like our, just like our boy Literally. Jesus from the last Jesus. episode. Jesus. All right, so obviously the most. This is the phrasing that attracted me initially. Right when I heard this paradoxical phrase, I wanted to examine the text more closely. Sure, sure. Basically, form is emptiness emptiness is form i mean that's that's yeah i think to be honest like not to criticize your translation but i think it's even neater if you just dropped that nothing other than it's because it's well but they're they're that's i'm trying to be literal with the chinese okay but yeah that's you can summarize it that way form is emptiness emptiness is form and it does repeat itself like that slightly you know there's repetition variation it's slightly changed you know uh and then here are the other four skandhas did you notice that feeling thought action awareness are also like this Mm -hmm. so basically everything is emptiness right anything you want to say about that yeah i mean i think we'll probably spend we should in some way spend the the heart of our discussion today on these two lines because no pun intended yeah exactly uh yeah this is this i heard this described as the famous kernel of the text and uh well i think one thing i, mean, I think the word emptiness is really important for us to interrogate um so I don't know, should we start without, we try to start maybe without our brains too, maybe just thinking about how, or without intellectualizing too much, just about the the two lines, just. Form is emptiness, emptiness yeah. is form. Right. Well, it's almost it's like a, not to bring it's almost the like a stuff, Zen, but... it's almost like a Zen koan, isn't it? Yeah, the paradoxical element, right? Yeah. Like, how can that be? And yet, I do feel that I understand it, you know? Right. Form right. is emptiness, emptiness is form. I mean, this is, this, uh, this text, I think, was a favorite of Schopenhauer's. You know, he very much liked this paradoxical idea. I don't know if okay, he, well, I, I think he, maybe like alluded to uh something similar in let's say the upanishads or something but it's it's very much present i mean you you've get you can find sentiment sentiments like these in the vedas even going sure. back to the earliest sure. hindu texts yeah i mean so much that's based on principles of illusion right i mean that's like so fundamental to to eastern thought yeah and like being and being and non-being time is an illusion yeah every, everything is I mean, I, there's even i mean one of the terms what is the official term for illusion in in hinduism i don't know but uh maya maya, maya yeah, exactly yes exactly so it's a huge huge concept but Okay, so let's see if we... Are you sympathetic to just a 
the idea of form is do you see that as just any attempt to individual is is there a verb individuate individuate is there is that a word yeah okay so any attempt to individuate is that what you see as form because that's kind of like one of the interpretations i'm seeing online is that form just means yeah the way that we break things down into separate things that's or that's like the tick hat none that when he when he was discussing this idea that was like the the interpretation that he was running with that yeah and and we've seen that in so much you know it, that's almost like it's still worth discussing but it's almost like banal at this point maybe it's, it goes back to like to the doors of perception the blake stuff you know just like the, the if you, you can't see the whole right you're just seeing a little piece uh or even back to Plato, right, in the cave. I mean, you'd be able to speak to that better than I would. But forms, do we do we see forms as the, the things that we interpret as individual items in our universe? Is that how you interpret that? Sorry, that was a bit messy. Well, I'm, I'm distracted now because you mentioned Plato, who believes, I mean, he believes that the forms are the only real things, you know? But aren't they, but then what is the cave saying? Isn't it saying that they're also, isn't that the idea that they're just replicas of like the original form? Yeah, but that's, I see in, what you're this, saying, that that, but that's like, in this world. But he believes in like a, an otherworldly universe of these. Perfect forms. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's Idea, true. So, ideas yeah. or ideals. So, you know, this is... I guess you could say it's like the negation of that. It's the reverse of that. It's like, all no, all the forms that we see in this floating world, as the Japanese came to think of it, that is all illusion. Uh, but the reality is the emptiness, the void... Yeah, I mean, I think Plato probably wasn't meditating too much. I think he was quite a, a heady young lad. So probably he was quite seduced by thought, for example. Well, I don't know. I mean, he was... I think he learned a lot from the Pythagoreans, so he probably... And he probably, you know, experienced the mysteries of Eleusis where they very likely did some kind of psychedelic drug. Okay. But anyway. Well, coming back to do you, is form individuation? Is that what you how you interpret form? I just see it as like well, what I said, basically this this world of maya. I I see it as basically the world of maya. The what the Chinese call the 10,000 things. Basically everything in the material world that we can see or perceive okay so not so uh, much of an emphasis on like the whether everything is connected or not but just the fact that things are well again it reminds me of that phrase that you say i i love so much both and you know uh-huh Everything is nothing. Nothing is everything. So I want to throw out that another translation of emptiness has been boundlessness. Okay. Like which I think gives a different... Or something? Yeah, which gives a different tinge, right? Because it's... And I think what Thich Nhat Hanh was going on about in his lecture on emptiness is he wanted to emphasize that emptiness is not nothingness. So right. for him, he wanted to stress that he was interpreting it more as like interconnection or oneness and that the illusion is 
the separation. And then that comes back to like, I think the Blakeian doors of perception stuff. Right. Then, cause the that, infinite. that folk, yeah, the infinite and the, the illusion being not that form exists, but that form exists separately. That's right, so there's illusory. like two different. Right, so that's that, illusory. That comes... The idea well, that form, no, the the idea that form is separate from the infinite. That's that's the illusion. Yes, exactly. Okay, okay. And yeah. that any anything separate, anything separate, like you can't separate anything, whether it's time. Because everything is related and everything's one. Yeah. But I guess I'm just saying emptiness, for some people, emptiness might have some negative connotation, right? In some way. Yeah. Because it's, it suggests lack, whereas it's right. not really... Human, well, I want to... Which I, I think wanna... is an is a interesting reading. And sorry, I don't, I don't want to discount that as a reading either, because maybe there is some value to... To more like going with the direction of void rather than boundless. I well, I want to talk. I want to talk yeah, about please, that please, particular sure. word in a minute. But um, sure. Uh, getting back to this idea of both and, it it reminds me of Schopenhauer. You know his his great work, the world as will, and representation. He. You know he basically adopts a both and perspective too like you, you can't deny uh what does he call it the principle of uh oh i can't remember the term but it's basically like the freudian reality principle you know like there there's something that you can't deny if you you may say to yourself oh i in the universe are one but if if you punch the wall in front of you you're going to have a very different impression you know what i mean sure sure or if you or if you have a conflict you may say uh thou i and thou are one you right. know but when we have a conflict it certainly doesn't feel like we're one so it's both and yes we are right. separated in this material world but ultimately when we go back to this nothingness or this infinitude we are one you know and We're i think we one. should also yeah and i think we should note that the then then the effort becomes to to grow towards the experience of oneness so it's not like even if we grant that both exist you can achieve a rea uh, an experience that takes you closer to that oneness, right? So. Well, but why do people need to chant a sutra or hear a sutra or why do they need a mantra? Because they require this reminder you know sure they 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 we we all need to be reminded from time to time of the infinite most of us don't live like that you know we have to survive in this world of maya this material right. world right. that requires us to you know sometimes compete with others or we're sometimes in conflict with others and we forget so we have the mantra or the prayer or the chant or the sutra or whatever spiritual activity to remind us of the interconnectedness, reconnect us with the nothing or the infinite. I'm quite comfortable thinking of nothing, you know. that I know what you mean. To some people that's like negative, but I take comfort in that, you know. And I, again, I think in this I'm, similar to schopenhauer who can enjoy again it's both and he can enjoy this the shadow play of the of the material world or the the floating world but ultimately 
It's nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Yeah, I mean, I guess I I wonder to what extent this becomes like a comfort, though, for people who are not getting enough out of the material world, right? Like, if you're having a blast in the world of Maya, then you don't necessarily feel as motivated to be be contemplating the nothingness. Yes. <laughs> I don't know well, what that means, except that... No, I understand. In that sense, it's like more about solace than it is about truth. Yeah. But anyway. Well, I mean, I'm imagining... I'm thinking about this lady in our neighborhood, okay... She's always out on the street, chanting at traffic, you know, just uh, doing these Buddhist chants. Amitofo, 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 just over and over and over, you know, like an insane person. And sometimes she'll go stand in front of a, a restaurant that sells meat. And she'll just start doing these Buddhist chants, you know, like trying to shame them uh -huh. for for serving meat. And I just I try to imagine her life like where does she live? She's out there on the street every day, like all day, all night. You know, she's I don't know if she's homeless or what. Or do, does some temple pay her to like do this kind of PR or whatever? But she's like, you know basically living on the street chanting at random passers-by who just ignore her well, she made it onto texting yeah she made it onto texting she's a <laughs> celebrity now but you know what how did she become such a I, I guess you'd have to call her a fanatic of sorts right like how did that happen she must have had some horrible traumatic experience and then this was like her only means of salvation yeah i mean she keeps things interesting i'm not trying to be glib but you know who knows whether she's further along or further behind you in terms of her spiritual growth yeah well you know, i'm not which life she's on I'm not uh, making a comparison or judgment, although, you know, personally, well, here, here's a, an interesting example, right? This uh, phenomenon in the world of Maya, okay, I encounter this. What is my, what is my reaction? Uh, it's fucking annoying, you know, like I'm, I pass by, uh, I'm riding a bike home. And I, I pass this corner where she's standing and I'm listening to her. And it's like, sometimes it's, I'm not expecting it. You know, I, do, I don't remember that she's there. And then suddenly I hear her screeching voice shouting and like admonishing other people, including me. And it's annoying, you know. But when I look at it from another perspective i say okay well i accept this too this is part of the the everything that is nothing but if, she, if she's shrieking buddhist mantras is the heart sutra not one of them she usually just chants the buddha's name that's like the amitabha the chinese the chinese is amitovo 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 and she always does it like in a sing song kind of way, you know. I mean just over and over. It's 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 like a I like that she's kind of stepped out of modern time though, you know, in a way. So she's kind of given life a yeah, more well come visit. You can quality. you can hang out okay. with her. Maybe I'll yeah, introduce exactly. you. You Thank can you. you can you know, go with her from restaurant to restaurant and shame the carnivores. Can you repeat the the chant one more time and just do it a little bit more exaggeratedly? Ami twofo, ami twofo, ami twofo. Thank you, thank you. That's the one that we'll clip later for the memes. Nice. 
All right, so I don't know where this leaves us. Oh, I want to talk about the two key words, form and emptiness. Yeah. This is this is quite interesting when we look at the Chinese because the word they're translating form is actually the word for color, color. right? Color. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you knew I that. Read a, I just read about that or in my research. So what does that say? So well, I've color. Yeah, go on. Why is that real. translated form? It it could. I mean, it reminds me of that Japanese concept of the floating world, right? Like the material world is variety, color. Yeah. You know, spectacle. And it then the, it's it's pretty consistent in that sense. And I also heard that they're but form I think of as like, you know, structure design yeah i mean the interpretation that i heard was just first of all color is like i don't know but it did seem that ultimately form actually was the best translation like yeah well i think so i think probably in english that makes the most sense but when you dig into the chinese that's a pretty interesting but my point was from the chinese it wasn't only color from what i understood it was like color but also it had other in- yeah i know but i'm just meanings. telling you like sure. in common usage right especially now i don't know about the time the text was allegedly written but you know this is the common word for color like hongsa red color you know And and it's being translated form here like it's the most one of the most important abstractions. The other being, and this word too is interesting, kong, which they're translating emptiness. But you know, in common parlance, we say something like "wo kong." I don't have free time. You know, like mm-hmm. I. I I don't have an empty schedule. But that that's the word for like leisure, almost like the Latin uh, otium, you know, that uh, refers to, or the Greek skole, like, you know, time off, free time. It's like the, it's like the opposite of being busy in the workaday material world you know what i mean okay so in using those like yes or no using those more like vulgar translations or primal translations so then it would be what color no color is nothing other than free time or (laughs) you know leisure but the idea would be that there's an antonym relationship yeah between color and leisure yeah 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 well that makes sense i guess right if color is like activity right right and the free time would be more like a white blank slate or something. right right or or black you know yeah like no no color the absence of color mm-hmm. so you got color and the absence of color so right. it could be black or white, right? Like if you mix all the colors, you get black, but all of the colors of the rainbow are white. Mm-hmm. Or is it the other way around? I think that's what it is. You know what I mean? <laughs> I keep saying yeah. that. You know what I mean? When I'm trying to... <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean, dog? When I'm trying to explain <laughs> these concepts which can't be explained? <laughs> you guys know what I'm saying? No, I'm like saying... You know what I'm saying? No, I'm saying. So that's just two. That's just two syllables, by the way. No, I'm saying. No, I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Noam Chomsky. <laughs> Noam Chomsky. No, I'm saying. Sorry. All right. Where does that leave us? We talked about Sariputra form and emptiness. I think we can talk about form and emptiness a little bit more, like uh, emptiness. I mean, obviously, I just one 
There's a lot in of yo- emptiness in this podcast as we pause <laughs> to try to think of what to say. In my yoga practice, like, uh, or in meditation practices, they often talk about, like, the key moment where, where you can experience some, like, liberation from thought is, like, the space between the breath. So I think that's worth mentioning, that that's, like, kind of an interesting idea that the space... You mean after the exhale? Yeah, between the inhale and the exhale and between the exhale and the inhale. That's like supposed to be like the magic places that you can you can get some some emptiness, some relief in a way. Okay. And and, and that's supposed to be really like telling as well. Like if, if we're if you're someone who super strongly identifies with your thoughts and all your mental activity, then what do you what do you what is your what do you have to say about those spaces that you have like is that not you is that not like equally valid so yeah i think that's like one direction that spiritual practices will push you just to be like look that's the that's the stuff that you want right and and when you meditate for me usually like around the 8 minute mark is when I'll start getting like some real slow down of brain activity and like start getting a little more blissed out with uh, with just some some good old emptiness. You time so, it. I don't know. You use a timer. Well, I just I I often like do a ten minute. I try to do a ten minute when I do meditate, which isn't like that often, but I go for ten minutes because like five minutes, it's still everything helps. Like even two minutes can help, but like. Yes. I find that, like I said, around eight minutes is when I really start to like notice, ah, like the rapidity and like the super brain activity that was going on at the beginning. Like I definitely notice like it slowed down and it's cool to notice because like at the beginning, I it seems almost impossible that that it will slow down. Right. Like I just right. really feel like dominated by my thoughts. <laughs> And you're like, oh, no, it actually, like, you genuinely can lower the volume on all that shit. Do you have a particular technique or you just do breathing? I have a few. um, Kind of my go-to is, like, just inhale, I'm aware that I'm breathing in. Exhale, I'm aware that I'm breathing out. Another one, like, I got from Tik Hat Nan is, like, on the inhale, you you think mountain, and on the exhale, solid. So kind of use those two. Mountains mountain and solid? Solid. solid. Yeah, so, solid, yeah. I don't understand. I think it's just supposed to be like a very grounding image. Mm, so okay. like you are a mountain, like immovable, I guess, in, the, in that way, like kind of permanent uh, I don't know. What about you? Well, basically, uh, breathing while remaining focused on the solar plexus. I mean, it's it's basically mindfulness meditation in the form of breathing. It's, I guess you could say, like the Thai Vipassana, you know. Okay. You don't know. Yeah, I th- I kind of do, yeah. It's but it's just it's, it's just minute. concentration on the breath. But uh recently I've gotten into this yoga nidra. Have you heard about this to help with my yeah, insomnia? Bro. It's I called did Yoga Nidra like a week ago. Okay. Well, I yeah. It's I recently discovered it, non-sleep deep rest. So uh it, that's basically a body scan which can be one aspect of Vipassana if it's like a a guided meditation, you know, like body awareness, body scan. Uh, but yeah, body scan is like what I think of when I think of Yoga Nidra. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a it's a guided thing. I just listen to someone talking me through it, and usually it it usually works pretty well. You know, like I. I uh, can fall asleep within 15 minutes, which is something I sorely need on occasion. 
Uh, do you know what Shavasana is? No. Shavasana is like the final resting pose in yoga. It's like the last mm-hmm. pose. Mm-hmm. And it basically means like corpse pose. Okay. Um, and, uh, but it's interesting because like, uh, like I usually like kind of silence for Shavasana and like kind of going for that emptiness thing. But Liliana, like as a yoga teacher, will often kind of narrate these relaxing journeys for the mind, you know, which is like a whole genre, subgenre in itself. If you go into like, uh, like a meditation app or something and you get your different choices of what kind of meditation you want to do. And so you get a bunch of them that are like these guided meditations that like take you to tranquil places, you know, like now you are in this water place and, and it's just weird because for me, I don't like those at all. Cause I find that they're very like brain activating, you know, like it's, and they there's, it's quite po- you too much. Well, it's like, yeah, like I'm trying to like quiet my brain. And then when I'm told to kind of like imagine stuff, like imagine that I'm in, like think of a time that like a very basic example would be like, think of a place where you're really comfortable. Right. And then I'll start thinking, well, I don't know, like I can't find a place because each of the places like there'll be some kind of blemish or yeah, like anxiety related thing for me. And even, or even, you know, or think about a person like, you know, that you feel like really, like you really love. And I'll be like, well, I love this person, but like, is this, so I, it's just interesting that people have different tastes in what they look for in those kind of like relaxation things. Yes. Yeah, so, Cause I'm always going for more of just like, let's quiet. And some people are more about like placing themselves in somewhere really relaxing and, and, and comforting. Like, even my place. buddy Steve yeah, my buddy Steven at my previous job, he likes to do that kind of stuff. Like, but for me, that doesn't work at all. I don't know if you if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I think everyone's different. You know, you just got to find what works for you and what doesn't and stick with that. And then you might find after a while it no longer works and you got to go find sure. something else. That's but have you ever done experience. that? Any of, any of that stuff? Like tried to put yourself in some positive place from your past like is that something you ever do i I did like uh it was called a i don't know if it was called a spirit quest or what but i was supposed to like try to get in touch with my animal spirit okay like i i lay on a couch and listen to this uh music and just tried to visualize i mean the instructions were try to find your spirit animal you know so i just were you alone in this place or were you with other people i was alone i mean my my friend had like the the cd or the mp3 or whatever of the music and he gave me the instructions but then like you know he left and i just lay down on the couch and and then i went into like a trance state and i I met my spirit animal. So which, that was like which successful. Was a, which was a fox. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess I I did see the fox, so I guess it worked. Nice. That's Liliana's favorite animal. Um. By the way, I'll tell you a really stupid <laughs> stupid anecdote today. I went to this park in St. Petersburg, and you've got like all these like uh, really hyper squirrels. Mm-hmm. And the squirrel approached me and like, like, you know, asking for like a nut or whatever. And it got so close that like I was genuinely scared and I like ran. I, sp- I, sp- I ran away from the squirrel, bro. You, you ran away from your <laughs> spirit animal. <laughs> but, but that's just like, it's like the, I don't know. I'm lucky that Liliana loves me pretty intensely because I feel like that's pretty bad as far as like the the masculine ideal is when you're, you're actively like terrified of a squirrel and sprinting away from it. Well, who knows, man? Squirrels might be the <laughs> the source of the next pandemic. So maybe you're just yeah, ahead exactly. of the game. Exactly. After monkey pox, squirrel pox. Yeah. And then, of you know, Bill, Bill yeah. Gates will give you a vaccine and everything will be just fine. Yep. 
All right. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to also point out that, like, in, I don't know, the one, two, three, four, fifth stanza, I guess, and th- these are arbitrary groupings to some extent, but I translated uh, the word path. <laughs> I said no path. I just wanted to point out the that's the Chinese Tao. So, you know. Okay. Way, the Tao Te Ching. Uh, it's the, the, the very same way or road mm-hmm. path. So there's no... There's no Tao, basically, is what this is saying. No suffering, no cause, no end, no Tao. And no doubt. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Are we done? We're up on an hour here. What else we got? Oh, we should talk about Nirvana, right? And can I add, can we, if we come back, just, I think it's important that it's not just read as form itself as emptiness like it's equally important to think of emptiness itself as form so like i think the seductive way to read this is like or you could say like superficial way to read this sutra is to be like oh everything's nothing you know like it's all maya and like this just confirms it so let's not put too much weight on everything that is around us. And of course, like that's an important like chunk of it, but emptiness itself is form is like pushing back on that a little bit. Yes. Right. I mean, you can't, you can't. Sorry. And I know we did talk about that now that I mentioned, yeah, but well, but I, I see your point. It's not, it doesn't get you off the hook as it were. It doesn't exactly. uh, You're still responsible for what happens in the world of Maya, you know, but the awareness of the nothingness, the infinitude, and so on can help you better function in the world sure. of Maya as a more compassionate and even competent being. Right. You know, by, by getting in touch with with that emptiness, you can deal with the form better. Because you realize they're they're one. I mean, again, it goes back to the earliest ideas of Hindu mythology. You go back to the Rig Veda, and there's the idea being came from non-being. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that that's basically saying form came from emptiness, right? Mm-hmm. So, so what? Well, I guess... In this other monk's explanation that I was watching, he was just warning. Yeah, he's warning against people kind of latching on to the emptiness concept too strongly because then you're also being seduced by a form. I guess that's the point. Well, if you fetishize nothingness or emptiness, I said nothingness because I'm thinking of the existentialist right? Like Sartre, being in nothingness. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of, that's a similar dichotomy. Being would be the form and nothingness would be the emptiness, right? But let's say, you know, he accepts this idea of nothingness. He's still very much an ethical person or concerned with ethical issues, right? Like you still have to deal ethically. It, it makes you even more ethically responsible being aware of the emptiness, being aware of the nothingness or emptiness or infinitude, which ultimately maybe means nothing. It, it makes you value the form more, makes you value being even more. I think that's, I think. Why is that? Can you, can you explain that? I'm not sure I can, but I feel it to be true for myself personally. Like knowing, maybe it's like this, knowing that it's all just a play, that it's not real, that it's ultimately meaningless. It makes me value it more, makes me value the, the play more. 
and the the players, the other people that are, you know, playing. Right. All the world's a stage. Yeah, and exactly. all the men and women merely players. Knowing that makes it that much more precious. In a way, of course, there are other days when I just want to end the play. You know, tear it all down. Leave yeah. not a rack behind. <laughs> Go Othello on that shit. Well, that's Tempest, actually, but... <laughs> okay, okay. By the way, as I Wait, did is that right? go to this... Yeah, I think that's Prospero. Anyway. Just, I went to a, a Buddhist temple in St. Petersburg today. It's pretty nice. I think I sent you a couple of Oh, times. yeah, I didn't realize that's what it was. Yeah. So. And... It was just nice that our visit coincided with like the start of the service, so we kind of hung out for about five minutes. It was mainly chanting and some accompanied kind of drum, gong, cymbal sounds. Uh, mm -hmm. Impressive visually, and uh, nice that. Did you chant? Did you chant? Too? No, we didn't. We didn't know the chant. Um, I have like chanted. I don't know if you've heard of the chant. Nam Myoho Renge Kyo? No. Okay, it's like a. I guess it's like a branch of Buddhism that. So I went. That was active in. In Phoenix, but I think it's like a, a worldwide. Branch of. Of Buddhism. It's probably like the Krishna, Hare Krishnas for Hindus. I would mm -hmm. say something like that could be like a good comparison. But. I remember saying it once to like a Korean colleague in my first job in Korea and she got really like angry because she was a Christian and she was like really against that that sect of Buddhists. Oh my. So that was that was interesting. But uh there's some interesting uh conflicts here too like the the Tibetan Buddhists are uh thought to be like exploiters of women and sexual abusers there you can even see there's a certain subway stop where there's this huge sign saying tibetan lamas are not real buddhists you know they're wow. sexual exploiters or something like that so they're interesting yeah because there are pictures of the dalai lama like at both of the buddhist sites i've been to in russia so mm -hmm. he's well, Probably he's like a he's figure. allegedly a CIA agent. So, would you say that like the relationship to Buddhism is similar in Taiwan to how it was in Korea, or is it more prominent? Well, it's more it's more mixed with the Taoist traditions, you know, like these. You don't have, in Korea, you don't have the Chinese gods that we have here. Uh, okay. You know, in addition to Guan Yin, who... I don't know if they have a version of her in Korea or not. I don't remember. But um, maybe they do. But, you know, they don't have... That's the goddess of mercy you mentioned before? Yeah, yeah. But they don't have, you know, these other specifically Chinese gods like, you know, Mazu who's a, a a mother goddess and goddess of the sea, kind of like Mary, you know, she's kind of like the equivalent of Mary, you know, Maria from Mar, the sea. Um, and then uh, Guang Gong. Maybe this is from the a, Taoist tradition? Yeah, well, I mean... Uh, I didn't know that there it's were a, it's deities like in Taoism. Tr traditional, it's all mixed, you know, it's all... Right, right. It's syncretic. You've got Buddhist, Taoist, uh, you know, Chinese folk religion. And then every, you know, we have like city gods or like neighborhood gods, you know. But uh, uh, Guanggong is a kind of war god or a god that you pray to uh, when you have like legal issues. Or if you're a, a lot of police officers pray to this God to help them, you know, solve crimes and so forth. 
but uh, he is based on a character from uh, Chinese. He's like a pseudo historical character, uh, a legendary character, and then he was deified. And Confucius, you know, Confucianism. Uh, we right. there are temples to Confucius who was uh, allegedly a, a real historical character. So it's all mixed, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's yeah, it's certainly different because you've got these specifically Chinese traditions that you don't find in in uh, Korea. Mm-hmm. But uh, what was I gonna say? Oh, then there's the writing god Wan Chong, who is he's my dude. But uh, nice. anyhow, we should before we close it out, let's talk about Nirvana. Which okay. is which is the name of a band, and also liberation from suffering. So mm-hmm. it says, you know, by leaving behind all confused dreamlike illusions, the bodhisattvas finally reach nirvana. And then it says, throughout the three ages, I don't know what the three ages are. All the Buddhas have relied on that, you know, transcendent wisdom to reach. Here's that term, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, which means supreme, perfect enlightenment. Mm -hmm. That's basically a synonym of transcendental wisdom, right? All of those, Nirvana, uh, Prajnaparamita, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, it's all basically the same thing. Enlightenment. Enlightenment, I could have translated all of them like that. But slightly different in that Nirvana is liberation, you know. Mm Mm-hmm kind of like freeing yourself from the world of the floating world the material world the world of maya okay right. now this is fascinating the word mantra this is a translation of a chinese word that means uh incantation spell and sometimes curse you know, so mantra, what they're translating mantra, that's obviously a, a Hindu term, right? A mantra. Right. It's really like a magical spell. You know what I mean? And it's even translated a great magic mantra. Shun Zhou. It's like, or sorry, Shun Zhou. I got the tones wrong. Uh, magic mon- magic mantra you know it's like a magic spell right that's right. pretty that's pretty crazy this is like magical language and you you know you're it's like an incantation and people when they're chanting it sometimes they're not even they're not focused on the meaning at all they're not even thinking of, thinking about it like they i know a lady that chants it every morning she starts her day every morning just chanting it you know in front of a little buddha with some incense and she just chants the whole thing and she's not focusing on the meaning necessarily and as i say a lot of these are are you know terms from sanskrit which don't even mean anything in chinese and then uh, you know at the end the the mantra words gate gate para gate parasma parasam gate bodhiswaha you know it's just right. like sounds that you lose yourself in you like use bro sounds. like i never i don't even know what that that mantra that i used to chant and i still sometimes chant like i don't know what it means but i when i repeat it enough times you know like change up the speed or whatever it's like yeah you got yeah, it's, it's just it, about it's trance inducing it's like the you exactly know, the paul van dyke you know music that sure. we were talking about it's trance you could sure. yeah you can use music you can use sound you can use words to enter that trance state Hare and, krishna Hare krishna 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 Hare Hare. there you go and exactly even, and and even the way bro like i've heard the way that some of these guys like these like krishna main like reciters they do it so fast Hare krishna Hare krishna 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 Hare 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 rama Hare, you know like it's like yeah. it's so hypnotic yeah, yes, it it's it's a form of hypnosis. It's hypnotic. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was thinking about the time 
when I was still in Houston, I was invited by these Persian Sufis to go to their mosque. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was like a, the imam or whatever gave a, a long sermon, which of course I understood not at all. Although my, <laughs> my friend was, she would translate parts of it for me. But, you know, basically I have no idea what's going on. But then they started chanting. And I don't know what they were chanting, but I just tried to imitate it, you know. And it was kind of kind of like a song, kind of like a chant. People were swaying. We were like, right. you know, rocking back and forth. And I really got into it. And I... Entered, Save him, Jesus! I entered, Save him! It wasn't like that, but it, it could so, be, you know. That's the same thing. Join yeah. the snake handlers. But I, I got into like a a trance like state and it was you know there was something blissful about it it was enjoyable i liked it and then afterwards you know that some of the older people didn't know how to communicate with me in english but this old man gave me a flower you know it's like thank you for coming thank you for being open to us not being like an anti-muslim fanatic you know it was just a nice gesture it, because i i guess he appreciated that you know i i came with my friend and i tried to participate even though i didn't understand or maybe he right. wanted to recruit me for some terrorist operation <laughs> yeah i'm sure that was it terrorism of love yeah anyway chant is a very powerful thing and you know, when we're saying gate, gate, para gate, para sam gate, bodhiswaha, we don't know what we're saying. Although, apparently it's translated, gone, gone, everyone gone to the other shore, awakening, swaha, which is, I don't know, like amen or something. Nice. But, uh, you know, we, I think chant is like, music in the sense that it can introduce this trance state that as we said before is a valuable thing you know it's a it's a form of ecstasy we stand outside of ourselves when we enter these states right it reconnects us with the nothingness the the emptiness which is also form right and i think it can be Empower. Sorry, I didn't mean to like. We should, maybe we should have sat with that for a moment. But uh, yeah, I think another it can be moment quite of silence. We've got too much emptiness yeah, exactly. in this episode. Well, you know, but people that are super invested, like bosses and people that are just super invested in the material world of like work, sometimes I think us lowly workers, minions, we can empower ourselves by by appealing to the nothingness and saying like, you know, these people who are really trying to make us feel that we should be working 24 hours a day and absolutely invested in the material world. Like, you know, we, we can come back to this and remember that there's more, there's more to us than, than, uh, various apps or whatever notifications that we have to respond to reconnect with the great mother exactly i think that's why you know <laughs> with the weeping machine the, the yeah the machine. suffering machine <laughs> shout outs to carlos as well for his take on the weeping machine Indeed. he had a nice explanation i can't remember what exactly he said but it was do you remember it was it was quite articulate uh, I don't remember. Oh, Maybe we can quote it next time. I was sure. just going to say that, you know, the feminine aspect, even though this Guan Tsai is originally masculine, it's this is understood to be Guan Yin talking. So, and as I say, like she's, she appears on these gold laminated cards that are passed out almost as, they're like good luck charms, you know, like you can mm -hmm. just pull it out of your pocket and start chanting it when you're 
experiencing stress or despair or something. But the, there's that feminine aspect, which, you know, helps us reconnect with the great mother of nothingness. I mean, yeah, Maya, I'm sorry Maya to be a bit is slow, but I'm... feminine, right? Well, I'm just realizing that, like, originally I think I thought sutra meant prayer, but it but mantra is more like prayer, and sutra is more like, what, like lesson? Text. Okay, text. Yeah, I mean, I know we discussed it in that sense. In We're the beginning, sutraing. But... Yeah. We're ching um, Texting. Right. So the thing that's that's on this uh, this laminated card is the gate gate. No, it's everything. It's the whole thing. The whole thing that I translated. It even has the title... Prajna Paramita Har Sutra, but you know, Prajna Paramita in Chinese and then Xin Jing Har Sutra. And then it's got the whole thing. But are people doing the mantra? Yes. More? Yes. They're doing the Gate Gate thing. Oh, well, that part, it's uh, the Chinese is, let me see, it's a little bit different. It's a translation of that. It's a let's see the got the gate is translated in Chinese uh, jie di jie di you know so that's the original the gate gate is Sanskrit or maybe okay. Pali but you know it's the Hindu Buddhist Indian of of Hindu origin you know but when right, but they, I mean they kept some of the original Sanskrit in the Chinese or no? Like no, the, but the the, the, what I'm telling you is that jie di, that is a, a Chinese approximation of gate. Like they don't, right. they, you know, they don't hear it that way. They hear it as jie di, jie di. So that's how they chant it. So they don't, okay, they don't okay. know when a native Chinese, per, a native Chinese person that doesn't know Sanskrit or Pali or something is chanting this. You know, it's just sounds. Jadi, Jadi. I don't think that has a meaning. Right. Bolo Jadi. Bolo Song Jadi. You know, maybe the part about uh, Bodhisattva, they, they understand that. They know, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, the word for bodhisattva is pusa, so they know what that is. But some of these other Sanskrit or Pali and or Pali terms, they they're just like approximated in Chinese, so they're just like sounds. And and again, that shows the the meaning may not be that important. It's like abracadabra, you know, it's magical language. And as as the uh, archaeologist or anthropologist Malinowski taught us there's always a coefficient of weirdness in magical language language which is supposed to try to accomplish something you know we're trying to do something mm -hmm. it's it's language that's trying to uh, create some result in the material world and in this case, the purpose of the magic language is to eliminate all suffering. Right. So, I hope we did that for all of you people out there. I hope we eliminated your <laughs> suffering forever and ever. And if not... Gate, then, gate. Yeah, gate, gate. Gone, gone. And if that doesn't work, then try chanting the Heart Sutra in the language of your choice. Is the heart sutra something that can be chanted though? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It usually it's is. It's so like story like, right? It's like a narrative. Yeah, I know, but the but in Chinese it's there's a rhythm to it. Uh, actually, you know, I I talked about my experience with the Sufis. I have some experience with it here too when my father-in-law passed away a few years ago. I mean, there are all kinds of, there are like 20 funeral ceremonies before he's finally cremated. A very complicated thing. 
and there's chanting, there's bowing, there's, you know, uh, kneeling. And uh, when the chanting starts, you, you're given a book and, you know, you go character by character. And some of these books have like the, the pinion uh, transliteration. So I can chant with them. And I don't know what they're saying. Sometimes I get lost, but I'm chanting too because I'm just reading. And I, I, can t I can hear where we are in the chant. And when I get lost, I can join them again. You know what I mean? And it right, just goes right, on yeah. forever. And people are sometimes people are talking, eating while the while others are chanting. It's a very interesting ceremony to behold. But uh, that too creates this uh, or can induce this trance-like state. You know, and mm. and also the the a lot of the the native Chinese speakers, they don't know, they'll tell you, I don't know what this means, but whatever, they, they still chant. So in some cases, like I'm no less clueless than they are. I'm just doing the same thing. They are just chanting these syllables with, and, and there's a rhythm, there's a rhythm, you know, you can, everyone gets it, I guess. Right. It, who knows? It's mysterious how it happens. You know, it's kind of like jamming, when you're playing music, someone starts and then everyone joins in and suddenly you're playing together, you know? Yep. All right. <laughs> and we should all play together again next week when our text will be what? Well, I've narrowed it down to two paintings, either a painting by Camille Pissarro or Vasily Kandinsky. I think the Kandinsky might be more powerful. That would be so. that would be my vote, but it's your choice. Yeah. I haven't even seen the one you're talking about, but I like Kandinsky. Okay. So either way, we'll probably be going back to the visual the arts. Visual arts. Yeah. Okay. We'll look right. forward to that. Big ups, everybody. And uh, do we want to say anything about Queen Elizabeth before we go? Well, I think I think we'll do something. I think that'll be my next choice. Some text related to the uh, erstwhile Queen of England. Okay. God bless King Charles. Peace, everybody. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> Texting. <laughs>